There's a passage that was chanted this morning, part of which said, the world has nothing of its own. One has to pass on, leaving everything behind. Now that's partly true. Material things, relationships, we have to leave those behind. Although it's very rare that a relationship ends at the moment of death, we pick it up again in later life. But what really goes with us are the good and bad things we've done. The bad things are like weights that weigh us down, the Buddhist images of a cart that you have to drag behind you. It's heavy. But the good things are like a shadow. They follow you without you having to do anything at all. In fact, the Buddha talks about your good karma as being like wealth, noble wealth. The kind of wealth that fire can't burn, floods can't wash away. Nobody can steal. It's yours. And even as you leave this lifetime, it goes with you. In some ways, it actually goes before you, prepares the way. So it's good to think about that kind of wealth, because it comes from inside. It's something you can create yourself. It's not like the wealth of the world where you have to work for somebody else and they give it to you. You create it yourself. You're independently wealthy in a way that's really secure. The Buddha gives a list of seven qualities that are worth developing as a form of inner wealth. It starts with conviction. Formally, that's the conviction in the Buddha's awakening that he really did awaken to the truth. And the important part of that, especially as it relates to us, is that your actions really do shape your life. Good actions lead to happiness. Actions basically based on skillful intentions lead to happiness. Those based on unskillful intentions lead to unhappiness. Now that kind of conviction doesn't just sit there and say, yes, I believe that. It requires that you act on it. And the way you act on it to begin with is to practice virtue. That's the second form of noble wealth. Which you abstain from doing harm. No killing, no stealing, no illicit sex, no lying, no taking of intoxicants. You avoid harming yourself, you avoid harming others. And that way you get to live in a harmless world. And backing up that virtue to other forms of wealth. A healthy sense of shame and a healthy sense of compunction. Shame is something that's gotten a bad rap, especially in the modern psychology. But we have to understand there are two kinds of shame. There's the shame that's the opposite of pride, and that's unhealthy. It's debilitating. But then there's the shame that's the opposite of shamelessness, and that's something you want to maintain. Because shame is basically an issue of wanting to look good in the eyes of others. And it depends on whose eyes you want to look good in. You want to look good in the eyes of the noble ones, who are true judges of character and true judges of what's goodness. Then that shame is healthy. You think about doing things that are unskillful, you can just be embarrassed, thinking what they might think. That prevents you from doing a lot of things that would be unskillful. This is related to one of the basic principles of the Buddha said is important for awakening, which is admirable friendship, having admirable friends, people who exemplify and embody good qualities like conviction, virtue, generosity, discernment, and who encourage you to develop those qualities as well. And as we think about these people judging our behavior, they judge it not to take points away from us. It's more they judge it in terms of their compassion for us. They want to see us behave in ways that are going to be for our own good. So you don't want to disappoint them. 
they have that amount of compassion for you, you want to make sure you have that amount of, amount of compassion for yourself. That connects with the next treasure, which is compunction. This has nothing to do with how you look in the eyes of others. It's more a question of your own sense of you don't want to do anything that's going to cause harm. That's related to the exterior quality that the Buddha said was important for awakening, which is appropriate attention. You look at your actions, not in terms of whether you want to do them or don't want to do them, or like them or don't like them, but you look at them in terms of their consequences. Where are they going to take you? What will they give rise to? And the idea of doing something that would cause harm just doesn't appeal. This compunction is the opposite of callousness, it's the opposite of apathy. So it true is a treasure. It's your internal protection. The next treasure is knowledge. Knowledge, in this case, knowledge of the Dharma, the Dharma that shows you the way to the end of suffering. And the Pali says, having heard much. In those days when you heard things, especially about the Dharma, you would memorize it. You look at the Buddhist teachings and they're delivered in a format that's meant to be memorized. This is why we memorize some of the chants, both in Pali and in English. So you have something good sloshing around in your mind. To remind you what the basic principles of the Dharma are. Then there's generosity. We give freely, you give willingly. Not only of material things, but also of your time, your energy, your knowledge your forgiveness. And then finally there's discernment, where you see clearly how suffering is caused inside the mind and what you're going to do to put an end to that cause by developing the path, the path of virtue, concentration, discernment. Like we're doing right now, trying to get the mind still so it can see itself clearly, still with a sense of well-being. As you want to see yourself clearly, you have to see your actions and the results, and sometimes that takes time. Some actions give the results immediately. Others take a fair amount of time. So you want to be here watching what's going on so you can see these connections. So to do that, you have to have a sense of ease being here sense of well-being. So we breathe in a way that feels good, deep down inside. Think of the breath as a whole body process. It goes through all the nerves in the nervous system, all the vessels in the circulatory system, out to the tips of the fingers, out to the tips of the toes. You think of yourself not just sitting here looking at the breath, but wearing the breath, surrounded by the breath, bathed in the breath, immersed in the breath. With the breath all around you, flowing smoothly. It soothes the body, and it can also soothe the mind. When the mind is here with a sense of well-being, then when any thoughts that come up that would lead to anything unskillful, you see them clearly as they arise. And you see them for what they are, something you don't want to get involved in, because you're feeding the mind well. It's when we're hungry for pleasures that we sometimes go for anything. But when the mind has this inner sense of well-being, you can be a little bit more picky, a little more choosy about where you're going to look for your happiness. So these seven qualities, conviction, virtue, sense of shame, sense of compunction, learning, generosity, and discernment, these are the Buddha set of treasures. They're your independent wealth, because as I said, you can create as much as you like out of them. It's not like the wealth of the world where you print a lot of money, and the more you print, the lower the value of the money. 
Here, the more you create of these things, the higher their value. And there's nothing to stop you. You can make yourself as wealthy as you want, and you're not going to be accused of being greedy. And John, so what? You still like to make the point that when you're developing good qualities like that, wanting to develop them, wanting to have a lot, doesn't count as greed. It counts as initiative, which the Buddha said is one of the causes for happiness. So do your best to make yourself wealthy. But it's good to think about these forms of wealth as a different kind of economy, the economy of material wealth. You have to amass, 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 get, get, get. You make some investments, but you hope to get more back. And it's all a matter of amassing as much as you can. Whereas these forms of wealth operate in a different way, with virtue, a sense of shame, a sense of compunction. You're wealthy because of things you don't do, you don't harm. With generosity, you're wealthy because of the things you give away. Because in all these cases, the wealth is not so much in the things or in the actions. It's, it's in the state of mind. With generosity, the more you give away. You don't want to give away so much that, you can't aff that you're harming yourself, but you give away things that you don't need, but things that you might like to have, but you realize that you'd be happy to give them away. The mind becomes more and more spacious. As John Lee said, you're making the whole world your home. As you give to this person, give to that place, give to this person. Everybody becomes part of your family. And that's her virtue. A sense of shame, a sense of compunction. There's a sense of well-being, there's a sense of self-esteem that comes from knowing you, things you would not stoop to. So even though it's a wealth of things you don't do, it's definitely a a wealthy quality in mind. Now for the things that you do amass, that you do gather up, conviction, learning, and discernment, those are things that you, especially with the conviction, you're basically borrowing the Buddha's wisdom. With learning, you're borrowing the Buddha's wisdom. But it's one of those cases of what they call a non-refundable loan. You borrow it, but you don't have to pay it back. But you can invest it, so that it becomes your own discernment. An important part of the path is when you get to the point where you've confirmed for yourself that what the Buddha taught is true. There really is a deathless element in the mind. That's when your conviction is verified. And you pay the Buddha back, not by giving back your conviction, but by continuing to practice. As he said, the best way to show respect to him, the best way to show homage is homage through the practice, practicing the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma. In other words, not trying to change the truth to fit to your likes and dislikes, but you change your likes and dis dislikes to fit in with the Dharma. And then you act on what the Dharma requires. But even the wealth of discernment, there comes a point where the Buddha says you let that go as well. His image is of a series of relay chariots. You get into the chariot of virtue and it takes you in certain ways, then you get into the chariot of concentration, takes you further. And then cha chariots are the various stages of gaining insight as you meditate. Find the chariot of discernment that discerns the, the noble paths, discerns the fruit. And then you get out of the chariots, you've arrived.
and you don't carry the chariots around with you, or his image of a raft. You take the twigs and branches on this side of the river, you want to get over to the safety of the other side, because this side is dangerous. There's a passage where the Buddha says you've got vipers following you, you've got thieves following you. All the things in this world that would give rise to suffering. And you see there's safety on the farther shore. So you make a raft. You don't wait for the farther shore to come over and pick you up. You make a raft of what you can find in this side, the twigs and the branches and the leaves. Tie it together well and swim across. It's the image of the twigs and the branches and the leaves. You stand for your your own actions, even though actions are ephemeral, and the thoughts of the mind are ephemeral. So you put them together in the proper way, and they can take you across. And part of that raft is right view, the raft of discernment, virtue, concentration. And then you get to the other side, and you can put it aside. You don't have to carry that raft around on your head. That's the ideal form of wealth, where you don't have to hold on to anything at all. You don't have to amass things and then protect them and afraid that somebody else will take them away from you. This is a, a, re a wealth that supports you, gives you protection. Now, when you've perfected it, it doesn't require that you do anything else, else more. So that's the nature of noble wealth. That's the, the economy of goodness, which doesn't work in the same way as the economy of material things, because it involves areas where you abstain from doing things, areas where you give things away. But you get something a lot better in return. So when you think about the fact that we're in this world where we can't take things with us when we go, and we're all going to have to go. And then John Lee's image, he says, at some point we're all going to have to emigrate. We don't know when the order's going to come. So you put together the kind of wealth that you can take with you, noble wealth. And that way you never have to worry about being poor.